Purple Hibiscus by Chimamanda Ngozi Adish. In the, weeks, in the following weeks, the newspe- newspapers we read during family time sounded different. More subdued. The standard too was different. It was more critical, more questioning than it used to be. Even the drive to school was different. The first week after the coup, Kevin plucked green tree branches every morning and stuck them to the car, lodged above the number plate, so that the demonstrators at the government square would let us drive past. The green branches meant solidarity. Our branches never looked as bright as demonstrators though, and sometimes as we drove past, I wondered what it would be like to join them, chanting, freedom, standing in the way of cars. In the later weeks, when Kevin drove past Ugui Road, there were soldiers at the roadblock near the market, walking around, caressing their long guns. They stopped some cars and searched them. Once I saw a man kneeling on the road beside his pearl goat, 504, with his hands raised high in the air. But nothing changed at home. Jaja and I still followed our schedules still asked each other questions whose answers we already know. The only change was Mama's belly. It started to bulge, softly and suddenly. At first it looked like a deflated balloon, but by Pentecost Sunday it had elevated her red and gold embroidered church wrapper just enough to hint that it was not just the layer of cloth underneath or the knotted end of the wrapper. (coughs) The outer was decorated in the same same shade of red as Mama's wrapper. Red was the color of the Pentecost. The visiting priest has said mass in a red robe that seemed too short for him. He was young, and he looked up often as he read the gospel, his brown eyes piercing the congregation. He kissed the Bible slowly when he was done. It could have seemed dramatic if someone else had done it, but with him it was not. It seemed real. He was newly ordained, waiting to be assigned a parish, he told us. He and Father Benedict were clo- had a close mutual friend, and he was pleased when Father Benedict asked him to stay, uh, uh, visit and say Mass. He did not say how beautiful our St. Agnes' altar was, though, with its steps that glowed like polished ice blocks, or that it was one of the best altars in Enugu perhaps even in the whole of Nigeria. He did not suggest, as as all the other visiting priests said, that God's presence dwelled, dwelled more in St. Agnes, that the iridescent saints on the floor-to-ceiling stained glass windows stopped God from leaving. And halfway through his sermon, he broke into an Igbo song, Bunie Yanu Ya Enu, The congregation drew in a collective breath. Some sighed. Some had their mouths in a big O. They were used to Father Benedict's sparse sermon. To Father Benedict's pinch your nose mon. Slowly they joined in. I watched Papa purse his lips. He looked sideways to see if Jaja and I were singing and nodded approvingly when he saw our sealed lips. After Mass, we stood outside the church entrance waiting while Papa greeted the people crowded around him. Good morning, praise God, he said, before shaking hands with the men, hugging the woman, patting the toddlers, and tugging at the baby's cheeks. Some of the men whispered to him. Papa whispered back, and then the man thanked him, shaking his hand with both of theirs before leaving. Papa finally finished the greetings, and with the wide churchyard now mostly emptied of cars that had cluttered in it like teeth in a mouth, we headed to our car. That young priest, singing in the sermon like a godless leader of one of these Pentecostal churches that spring up everywhere like mushrooms. People like him him bring trouble to the church. We must remember to pray for him. Papa said as he unlocked the Mercedes door and placed the missile and bulletin on the seat before turning towards the parish residence. He always dropped in to visit Father Benedict after Mash. Let me stay in the car and wait, Biko, Mama said, leaning against the Mercedes. I feel vomit in my throat. 
Papa turned to stare at her. I held my breath. It seemed a long moment, but it might have been only seconds. Are you sure you want to stay in the set car? Papa asked. Mama was looking down. Her hands were placed on her belly to hold the wrapper from untying itself or to keep her bread and tea breakfast down. My body does not feel right, she mumbled. I asked if you were sure you wanted to stay in the car. Mama looked up. I'll come with you. It's not really it's really not that bad. Papa's face did not change. He waited for her to walk toward him, and then he turned, and they started to walk towards the priest ha- priest's house. Jaja and I followed. I watched Mama as we walked. Till then I had not noticed how drawn she looked. Her skin, usually smooth brown of brown nut paste, looked like the liquid had been sucked out of it. Ashen like the color of cracked harmattan soil. Jaja spoke to me with his eyes. What if she vomits? I would hold up my dress hems so Mama could throw up into it, so we wouldn't make a big mess in Father Benedict's house. The house looked as though the architect had realized too late that he was designing residential quarters, not a church. The arch that led into the dining area looked like an altar entrance. The alcove with the cream telephone looked like ready to receive the blessed sacrament. The tiny study room of the living room could have been a a sacristy crammed with holy books and mass vestments and extra chalices. (coughs) Brother Eugene, Father Benedict said. His pale face broke into a smile when he saw Papa. He was at the dining table, eating. There were slices of boiled yam, like lunch, but then a plate of fried eggs too, more like breakfast. He asked us to join. Papa refused on our behalf, and then went up to the table to talk in muted tones. How are you, Beatrice? Father Benedict asked, raising his voice so Mama would hear from the living room. You don't look well. I'm fine, Father. It's only my allergies because of the weather, you know, the clash of harmattan and rainy season. Kambili and Jaja, did you enjoy Mass then? Yes, Father, Jaja and I spoke at the same time. We left shortly afterwards, a little sooner than on the usual visit to Father Benedict. Papa said nothing in the car, his jaw moving as if he were gritting his teeth. We all stayed silent and listened to the Ave Maria on the cassette player. When we got home, Sissy had Papa's tea set out in the china teapot with a tiny ornate handle. Papa placed his missile and bulletin on the dining table and sat down. Mama hovered by him. Let me pour your tea, she offered, although she never served Papa's tea. Papa ignored her and poured his tea, and then he told Jaja and me to take sips. Jaja took a sip, placed the cup back on the saucer. Papa picked it up and gave it to me. I held it with both hands, took a sip of the Lipton tea with sugar and milk, and placed it back on the saucer. Thank you, Papa, I said, feeling the love burn my tongue. We went upstairs to change, Jaja and Mama and I. Our steps on the stairs were as measured and as silent as our Sundays. The silence of waiting until Papa was done with his siesta so we could have lunch. The silence of reflection time. When Papa gave us a scripture passage or a book by one of the early church fathers to read and meditate on, the silence of the evening rosary, the silence of driving to the church for benediction afterward, even our family time on Sundays was quiet, without chess games or newspaper discussions more in tune with the day of rest. Maybe Sissy can cook lunch by herself today, Jaja said when we got to the top of the curved staircase. You should rest before lunch, Mama. Mama was going to say something, but then she stopped. Her hand flew to her mouth and she hurried into her room. I stayed to hear the sharp groans of vomiting from deep in her throat before I went into my room. Lunch was jollof rice. This sized chunks of azu fried until the bones were crisp and nugu nugu. Papa ate most of the nugu nugu, his spoon swooping through the spicy broth in the glass bowl. 
Silence hung over the table like the blue-black clouds in the middle of the rainy season. Only the chirping of the Ochiri birds outside interrupted it. Every year they arrived before the first rains came and nested on the avocado tree right outside the dining room. Jaja and I sometimes found fallen nests on the ground, nests made of entwined twigs and dried grass and bits of thread that Mama had used to plait my hair with the ochiri picked out of the backyard dustbin. I finished lunch first. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Papa. Thank you, Mama. I folded my arms and waited until everybody was done so we could pray. I did not look at anybody's face. I focused instead on the picture of Grandfather that hung on the opposite wall. When Papa started the prayer, his voice quavered more than usual. He prayed for the food first. Then he asked God to forgive those who had tried to thwart his will, who had put selfish desires first and had not wanted to visit his servant after Mass. Mama's Amen resounded throughout the room. I was in my room after lunch, reading James chapter 5, because I would talk about the biblical roots of the anointing of the sick during family time, when I heard the sounds. Swift, heavy thuds on my parents' hand-carved bedroom door. I imagined the door had gotten stuck and Papa was trying to open it. If I imagined it hard enough, then it would be true. I sat down, closed my eyes and started to count. Counting made it seem not that long, made it seem not that bad. Sometimes it was over before I even got to 20. I was at 19 when the sound stopped. I heard the door open. Papa's gait on the stairs sounded heavier, more awkward than usual. I stepped out of my room just as Chacha came out of his. We stood at the landing and watched Papa descend. Mama was slung over his shoulder like the jute sacks of rice his factory workers bought in bulk at the semi border. He opened the dining room door. Then we heard the front door open, heard him say something to the gate man, Adamu. There's blood on the floor, Jaja said. I'll get the brush from the bathroom. We cleaned up the trickle of blood, which trailed away as if someone had carried a leaking jar of red watercolor all the way downstairs. Jaja scrubbed while I wiped. Mama did not come home that night, and Jaja and I had dinner alone. We did not talk about Mama. Instead, we talked about the three men who were publicly executed two days before for drug trafficking. Jaja had heard some boys talking about it in school. It had been on television. The men were tied to poles and their bodies kept shuddering, even after the bullets were no longer being pumped into them. I told Jaja what a girl in my class had said, that her mother had turned their TV off, asking why she should watch fellow human beings die, asking what was wrong with all those people who had gathered at the execution ground. After dinner, Jaja said grace, and at the end he added a short prayer for Mama. Papa came home when we were in our room studying, according to our schedules. I was drawing pregnant stick images on the inner flap of my introductory agriculture for secondary schools when he came into my room. His eyes were swollen and red, and somehow that made him look younger, more vulnerable. Your mother will be back tomorrow, about the time you get back from school. She will be fine, he said. Yes, Papa. I looked away from his face, back at my... He held my shoulders, rubbing them in gentle circular motions. Stand up, he said. I stood up, and he hugged me, pressed me close so that I felt the beat of his heart under his soft chest. Mama came home the next afternoon. Kevin brought her in the Pelgood 505 with the factory name emblazoned on the passenger door, the one that often took us to and from school. Jaja and I stood waiting by the front door, close enough for shoulders to touch, and we opened the door before she got to it. Umum, um, she said, hugging us. My children. She wore the same white t-shirt with God is love written on the front. Her green wrapper hung lower than usual on her waist. It had been knotted with a lazy effort at the side. Her eyes were vacant, 
like they like the eyes of those mad people who wandered around the roadside garbage dumps in town pulling grimy torn canvas bags with their life fragments inside there was an accident the baby is gone she said i moved back a little stared at her belly it still looked big still pushed at her wrapper in a gentle arc was mama sure the baby was gone I was staring at her belly when Sissy came in. Sissy's cheekbones were so high they gave her an angular, eerily amused expression, as if she were mocking you, laughing at you, and you would never know why. Good afternoon, madame, you no, know, she said. Will you eat now or after your bath? Eh? For a moment, Mama looked as though she did not know what Sissy had said. Not now, Sissy, not now. Get me water and a towel. Mama stood hugging herself in the center of the living room, near the glass table, until Sissy brought a plastic bowl of water and a kitchen towel. The etagerie had three shelves of delicate glass, and each one held beige ballet dancing figures. Mama started at the lowest layer, polishing both the shelf and the figurines. I sat down on the leather sofa closest to her close enough to reach out and straighten her wrapper. Nini, this is your study time. Go upstairs, she said. I want to stay here. She slowly ran the cloth over a figurine, one of its mastic-sized legs raised high in the air before she spoke. Nini, go. I I went upstairs then and sat, staring at my textbook. The black type blurred, the letters swimming into one another, then changed to a bright red, the fresh red of fresh blood. The blood was watery, flowing from Mama, flowing from my eyes. Later at dinner, Papa said we should recite sixteen different novenas for Mama's forgiveness, and on Sunday, the first Sunday of Trinity, we stayed back after Mass and started the novenas. Father Benedict sprinkled us with holy water, Some of the holy water landed on my lips, and I tasted the stale saltiness of it as we prayed. If Papa felt Jaja or me beginning to drift off at the thirteenth recitation of the plea to St. Jude, he suggested we start all over again. We had to get it right. I did not think, I did not even think to think, what Mama needed to be forgiven for. The words in my textbooks kept turning into blood each time I read them, even as my first term term exams approached, even when we started to do class reviews. The words still made no sense. A few days before my first exam, I was in my room studying, trying to focus on one word at a time, when the doorbell rang. It was Yuwandi Coker, the wife of Papa's editor. She was crying. I could hear her because my room was directly above the living room and because I had never heard crying that loud before. They have taken him. They have taken him, she said between throaty sobs. Yuandi, Yuandi, Papa said, his voice much lower than hers. What will I do, sir? I have three children. One is still sucking my breast. How will I raise them alone? I could hardly hear her words. Instead, what I heard clearly was the sound of someone catching in her throat. Then Papa said, Yuandi, don't talk that way. Adi will be fine, I promise you. Adi will be fine. I heard Jaja leave his room. He would walk downstairs and pretend that he was going to the kitchen to drink water and stand close to the living room door for a while, listening. When he came back up, he told me soldiers had arrested Adi Coker as he drove out of the editorial offices of the Standard. His car was abandoned on the roadside, the front door left open. I imagine Ad Aid Coker pulled out of his car, being squashed into another car, perhaps a black station wagon filled with soldiers, their guns hanging out of the windows. I imagined his hands quivering with fear, a wet patch spreading on his trousers. I knew his arrest was because of the big story in the Lost Standard. A story about how the head of state and his wife had paid people to transport heroin abroad. A story that questioned the recent execution of three men and who the real drug barons were. Jaja said that when he looked through the keyhole, 
Papa was holding Yiwandi's hand and praying, telling her to repeat, None of those who trust in him shall be left desolate. Those were the words I said to myself as I took my exams the following week, and I repeated them too as Kevin drove me home on the last day of school, my report card tightly pressed to my chest. The reverend sisters gave us our cards unsealed. I came second in my class. I was, it was written in figures, two out of twenty-five. My former mistress, Sister Clara, had written, Kambili is intelligent beyond her years, quiet and responsible. The principal, Mother Lucy, wrote, A brilliant, obedient student and a daughter to be proud of. But I knew Papa would not be proud. He had often told me that he did not spend so much money on daughters of the first of the Immaculate Heart and Saint Nicholas to let us have to have let us let other children come first. <coughs> Nobody had spent money on his own schooling, especially not his godless father, our Papa Nunuku. Yet he had always come first. I wanted to make Papa proud, to do as well as he had done. I needed him to touch the back of my neck and tell me that I was fulfilling God's purpose. I needed him to hug me close and say that to whom much is given, much is also expected. I needed him to smile at me in that way that lit up his face, that warmed something inside me. But I had come second. I was stained by failure. Mama opened the door even before Kevin stopped the car in the driveway. She always waited by the front door on the last day of school to sing praises, praise songs in Igbo and hug Jaja and me and caress our report cards in her hand. It was the only time she sang aloud at home. Omi mama ma chineki omi mama. Mama started her song and then stopped when I greeted her. Good afternoon, Mama. Nini, did it go well? Your face is not bright. She stood aside to let me pass. I came second. Mama paused. Come and eat. Sissy cooked coconut rice. I was sitting at my study desk when Papa came home. He lumbered upstairs, each heavy step creating turbulence in my head, and went into Jaja's room. He had come first as usual, so Papa would be proud would hug Jaja, leave his arms resting around Jaja's shoulders. He took a while in Jaja's room, though. I knew he was not looking through every individual subject's score, checking if to, to see if any had decreased by one or two marks since last term. Something pushed fluids into my bladder, and I rushed to the toilet. Papa was in my room when I came out. Good evening, Papa. No, no. Did school go well? I wanted to say I came second so that he would know immediately, so that I would acknowledge my failure. But instead, I said yes and handed him the report card. He seemed to take forever to open it and even longer to read it. I tried to pace my breathing as I waited, knowing all the while that I could not. Who came first? Papa asked finally. Chinmi Jidezi. Jidezi, the girl who came second last term? Yes, I said. My stomach was making sounds, hollow rumbling sounds that seemed too loud, that would not stop even when I sucked in my belly. Papa looked at my report card for a while longer. Then he said, come down for dinner. I walked downstairs, my legs feeling joint free, like long strips of wood. Papa had come home with the samples of a new biscuit, and he passed the green packet round before we started dinner. I bit into the biscuit. Very good, Papa. Papa took a bite and chewed, then looked at Jaja. It has a fresh taste, Jaja said. Very tasty, Mama said. It should sell by God's grace, Papa said. Our wafers lead the market now, and this should join them. I did not could not look at Papa's face when he spoke. The boiled yam and pre peppery greens refused to go down my throat. They clung to my mouth like children clinging to their mother's hand 
at a nursery school entrance. I downed glass after glass of water to push them down, and by the time Papa started grace, my stomach was swollen with water. When he was done, Papa said, Come, Billy, come upstairs. I followed him. As he climbed upstairs in his red silk pajamas, his buttocks quivered and shook like a camu, properly made a camu, jelly-like. The cream decor in Papa's bedroom was changed every year, but always to a slightly different shade of cream. The plush rug that sank in when he stepped on it was plain cream. The curtains had only a little brown embroidery at the edges. The cream leather armchairs were placed close together, as if two people were sitting in an intimate conversation. All that cream blended and made the room seem wider, as if it never ended, as if you could not run, not run even if you wanted to, because there was nowhere to run. When I had thought of heaven as a child, I visualized Papa's room, the softness, the creaminess, the endlessness. I would snuggle into Papa's arms when harmitant thunderstorms raged outside, flinging mangles against the window netting and making the electric wires hit each other and spark bright orange flames. Papa would lodge me between his knees or wrap me in the cream blanket that smelled of safety. I sat on a similar blanket now, on the edge of the bed. I slipped off my slippers and sank my feet into the rug and decided to keep them sunk in so my toes would feel cushioned, so that part of me would feel safe. Kambili, Papa said, breathing deeply, you didn't put in your best this term. You came second because you chose to. His eyes were sad, deep and sad. I wanted to touch his face, to run my hand over his rubbery cheeks. There were stories in his eyes that I would never know. The phone rang then. It had been ringing more often since Aid Coker was arrested. Papa answered it and spoke in low tones. I sat waiting for him until he looked up and waved me away. He did not call me the next day or the day after to talk about my report card, to decide how I would be punished. I wondered if he was too preoccupied with Aid Coker's case. But even after he got him out of jail a week later, he did not talk about my report card. He did not talk about getting Aid Coker out of jail either. We simply saw his editorial back in the standard, where he wrote about the value of freedom, about how his pen would not, could not stop writing the truth. But he did not mention where he had been detained, or who had arrested him, or what had been done to him. There was a postscript in italics where he thanked his publisher, a man of integrity, the bravest man I knew. I was sitting next to Mama on the couch during family time, and I read that line over and over, and then closed my eyes, felt a surge run through me, the same feeling I got when Father Benedict talked about Papa at Mass, the same feeling I got after I sneezed, a clear tingling sensation. Thank God aid is safe, Mama said, running her hands over the newspaper. They put out cigarettes on his back, Papa said, shaking his head. They put out so many cigarettes on his back. They will, they will receive their due, but not on this earth, Mba, Mama said, although Papa did not smile at her. He looked too sad to smile. I wished I had thought to say that before Mama did. I knew Papa liked her, having said that. We are going to publish underground now. It is no longer safe for my staff. I knew that publishing underground meant that the newspaper would be published from a secret location. Yet I imagined Aid Coker and the rest of the staff in an office beneath the ground, a fluorescent lamp flooding the dark, damp room. The men bent over their desks, writing the truth. That night, when Papa prayed, He added longer passages, urging God to bring about the downfall of the godless men ruling our country, and he intoned over and over, Our Lady, shield of the Nigerian people, pray for us. The school break was short, only two weeks, and the Saturday before school resumed, Mama took Jaja and me to the market to get new sandals and bags. We didn't need them, 
Our bags and brown leather sandals were still new, only a term old, but it was the only ritual that was ours alone, going to the market before the start of each new term, rolling the car window down as Kevin drove us there without having to ask permission from Papa. In the outskirts of the market, we let our eyes dwell on the half-naked mad people near the rubbish dumps, on the men who could casually stop to unzip their trousers and urinate at corners, on the women who seemed to be haggling loudly with mounds of green vegetables until the head of the trader peeked out from behind. Inside the market, we shrugged off traders who pulled us along the dark passage, saying, I have what you want, or come with me, it's here, even though they had no idea what we wanted. We scrunched up our noses at the smells of bloody fresh meat and musty dried fish, and lowered our heads from the bees that buzzed in thick clouds over the sheds of the honey sellers. As we left the markets with our sandals and some fabric Mama had brought, bought, we saw a small crowd gathered around the vegetable stalls we had passed earlier. The ones lining the road. Soldiers were milling around, market women were shouting, and many had both hands placed on their heads, in the way pe- that people do to show despair or shock. A woman lay in the dirt, wailing, tearing at her short afro. Her wrapper had come undone, and her white underwear showed. Hurry up, Mama said, moving closer to Jaja and me, and I felt that she wanted us to to shield us from the seeing sh- from seeing the shoulders and the woman as we hurried past i saw a woman spit at a soldier i saw the soldier raise a whip in the air the whip was long it curled in the air before it landed on the woman's soldiers another soldier was kicking down trays of fruit squashing papayas with his boots and laughing when we caught into the car kevin told the mama that the soldiers had been ordered to demolish the vegetable stalls because they were illegal structures. Mama said nothing. She was looking out of the window as though she wanted to catch the last sight of those women. I thought about the woman lying in the dirt as we drove home. I had not seen her face, but I felt that I had knew her, that I had always known her. I wished I could have gone over and helped her up, cleaning the red mud from her wrapper. I thought about her too on Monday as Papa drove me to school. He slowed down on Ogui Road to fling some crisp Naira notes at a beggar sprawled on by the roadside near some children hawking peeled oranges. The beggar stared at the note then stood up and waved after us, clapping and jumping. I had assumed he was lame. I watched him in the rear view mirror, my eyes steadily on him until he disappeared from sight. He reminded me of the market woman in the dirt. There was a helplessness to his joy, the same kind of helplessness as in that woman's despair. The walls that surrounded Daughters of the Immaculate Heart Secondary School were very high, similar to our compound walls, but instead of coiled electrified wires, they were topped by jagged pieces of green glass with sharp edges jutting out. Papa said the walls had swayed his decision, when I had finished elementary school. Discipline was important, he said. You could not have youngsters scaling walls to go into town and go wild, and the way they had done did at the federal government colleges. These people cannot drive, Papa muttered, when we got to the school gates, where cars nosed up to each other, horning. There is no prize for being first to get into the school compound. Hawkers, girls much younger than I, defied the school gate men, edging closer and closer to the cars to offer peeled oranges and bananas and ground nuts, their moth-eaten blouses slipping off their shoulders. Papa finally eased the car into the wide school compound and parked near the volleyball court, beyond the stretch of manicured lawn. Where is your class? he asked. I pointed to the building by the group of mango trees. Papa came out of the car with me. I wondered what he was doing, why he was here, why he had driven me to school and asked Jaja to take asked Kevin to take Jaja. Sister Margaret saw him as we walked to my class. She waved, she waved gaily from the midst of students and a few parents. 
then quickly waddled over to her. Her, her words flew generously out of her mouth. How was Papa doing? Was he happy with my progress at Daughters of the Immaculate Heart? Would he be at the reception for the bishop next week? Papa changed his accent when he spoke, sounding British, just as he did when he spoke to Father Benedict. He was gracious in the eager-to-please way that he had always assumed with the religious, especially with the white religious. As gracious as we, when he presented the check for refurbishing the Daughters of the Immaculate Heart Library, he said he had just come to see my class, and Sister Margaret told him to let her know if he needed anything. Where is Chinmi Jidez? Papa asked when we got to the front of my class. A group of girls stood at the door, talking. I looked around, feeling a weight around my temples. What would Papa do? Chinui's light-skinned face was at the center of the group as usual. She is the girl in the middle, I said. Was Papa going to talk to her? Yank at her ears for coming first? I wanted the ground to open up and swallow the whole compound. Look at her. How many heads does she have? One. I did not need to look at her to know that, but I looked at her anyway. Papa pulled a small mirror, the size of a powder compact, from his pocket. Look in the mirror, I stared at him. Look in the mirror. I took the mir mirror, peered at it. How many heads do you have, Bubo? Papa asked, speaking Igbo for the first time. One. The girl has one head too. She does not have two. So why did you let her come first? It will not happen again, Papa. A light dust ikuku was blowing in brown spirals like uncoiling springs, and I could taste the sand that settled on my lips. Why do you think I work so hard to give you and Jaja the best? You have to do something with all these privileges, because God has given you much. He expects much from you. He expects perfection. I didn't have a father who sent me to the best schools. My father spent his time worshipping gods of wood and stone. I would be nothing today but for the priests and sisters at the mission. I was a houseboy for the parish priest for two years. Yes, a houseboy. Nobody dropped me off at school. I walked eight miles every day to Nemo until I finished elementary school. I was a gardener for the priest while I attended St. Gregory's Secondary School. <sighs> I had heard all this before, how hard he had worked how much the missionary reverend sisters and priests had taught him, things he would never have learned from his idol-worshipping father, my papa Nunukwu. But I nodded and looked alert. I hoped my class girls were not wondering why my father and I had chosen to come to school to have a long conversation in front of the classroom building. Finally, Papa stopped talking and took the mirror back. Kevin will be here to pick you up, he said. Yes, Papa. Bye, read well. He hugged me. A brief side hug. Bye, Papa, I said. I was watching him walk down the path bordered by the flowerless green bushes when, I, when the assembly bell rang. Assembly was raucous, and Mother Lucy had to say, Now, girls! May we have silence a few times. I stood in the front of the line as always, because the girls at the back were the girls who belonged to cliques, girls who giggled and whispered to one another, shielded from the teachers. The teachers stood on an elevated podium, tall statues in their white and blue habits. After we sang a welcoming song from the Catholic hymnal, Mother Lucy read Matthew chapter 5 up to verse 11. And then we sang the national anthem. Singing the national anthem was relatively new at Daughters of the Immaculate Heart. It had started last year because parents were concerned that their children did not know the national anthem or the pledge. I watched the sisters as we sang. Only the Nigerian reverend sisters sang, teeth flashing against their dark skins, while the white reverend sisters stood with arms folded or lightly touching the glass rosary beads that dangled at their waists, carefully watching to see that every student's lips moved. 
Afterward, Mother Lucy narrowed her eyes behind her thick lenses and scanned the lines. She always picked one student to start the pledge before the others joined in. Kambide Achik, please start the pledge, she said. Mother Lucy had never chosen me before. I opened my mouth, but the words would not come out. Kambili Ashik, Mother Lucy, and the rest of the school had turned to stare at me. I cleared my throat, willed the words to come. I knew them, thought them, but they would not come. The sweat was warm and wet under my arms. Kambili, finally stuttering, I said, I pledge to Nigeria, my country, to be faithful, loyal, and honest. The rest of the school joined in, and while I mustered along, I tried to slow my breathing. After assembly, we filed into the classrooms. My class went through the routine of settling down, scraping chairs, dusting desks, copying the new term timetable written on the board. How was your holiday, Kambili? Azin leaned over and asked. Fine. Did you travel abroad? No, I said. I didn't know what else to say. But I wanted Azim to know that I appreciated that she was always nice to me, even though I was awkward and tongue-tied. I wanted to say thank you for not laughing at me and calling me a backyard snob, the way the rest of the girls did. But the words that came out were, Did you travel? Azini laugh. Me? Or the Eguru? It's people like you and Gabriela and Chinri who travel. People with rich parents. I just went to the village to visit my grandmother. Oh, why did your father come this morning? I, I, I stopped to take a breath because I knew I would stutter even more if I didn't. He wanted to see my class. You look a lot like him. I mean, you're not big, but the features and the complexion are the same, as Yini said. Yes, I heard Chinri took the first position from your last term. Abi? Yes, I'm sure your parents didn't mind. Ah, uh, ah, uh, you've been coming first since we started class one. Chinri said her father took her to London. Oh, I came fifth and it was an improvement for me because I came eighth the term before. You know our class is very competitive. I used to always come first in my primary school. Chinri Jitesi came over to Azini's table then. She had a high bird-like voice. I want to remain I want to remain class perfect prefect this term as a butterfly so make sure you vote for me Chinri said her school skirt was tight at the waist dividing her body into two rounded halves like the number 8 of course as Ine said I was not surprised when Chinri walked past me to the girl at the next desk and repeated herself only with a different nickname that she had taught, thought up Chinri had never spoken to me, not even when we were placed in the same agricultural science group to collect weeds for an al- album. The girls flocked around her desk during short break, their laughter ringing out often. Their hairstyles were usually exact copies of hers. Black thread-covered sticks if Chinri wore easy over that week, or zigzagging corn, corn rows that ended up in a ponytail atop their heads if Chinwi wore shuku that week. Chinwi walked as if there were hot object underfoot, raising each leg almost as soon as her other foot touched the floor. During long break, she bounced in front of a group of girls as they went to tuck shop to buy biscuits and coke. According to Azini, Chinwi paid for everyone's soft drinks. I usually spent long break reading in the library. Chinmi just wants you to talk to her first, as Zini whispered. You know, she started calling you a backyard snob because you don't talk to anybody. She said just because your father owns a newspaper and all those factories does not mean you have to feel too big. Because her father is rich too. I don't feel too big. Like today at assembly, she said you were feeling too big. That's why you didn't start pledge the first time Mother Lucy called you. I didn't hear the first time Mother Lucy called me. I'm not saying you feel too big. I'm saying that is what Chinri and most of the girls think. Maybe you should try and talk to her. Maybe after school you should stop running off like that and walk with us to the gate. Why do you always run anyway? 
I like I I just like running, I said, and wondered if I would count that as a lie when I made my confession next Saturday. If I would add it to the lie about not having heard Mother Lucy the first time. Kevin always had the pair good five or five parked at the school gates right after the bells rang. Kevin had many other chores to do for Papa, and I was not allowed to keep him waiting, so I always dashed out of my last class, dashed as though I were running the 200 meter race at the Interhouse Sports Competition. Once Kevin told Papa I took a few minutes longer, and Papa slapped my left and right cheeks at the same time, so his huge palms left parallel marks on my face and ringing in my ears for days. Why? Azini asked. If you stay and talk to people, maybe it will make them know that you are not re- really not a snob. I just like running, I said again.